Esse é o Vitor. Vitor é um beta. Eles também são. E isso é uma pequena parte do que eles fizeram ano passado. Sim, eles beijaram. Sem filtro, com filtro. Eles cantaram juntos. Criaram juntos. Se encantaram com coisas pequenas. Mas também com experiências. Transformaram tudo isso em pontos. Pra continuar sendo o que são. Betas. Thank you. Este programa é um mito. Um... Hi. Hi. Well, um, I was born with an unusual visual condition called achromatism, which is total color blindness. So I've never seen yellow, blue, pink. I don't know what color looks like. But when I was growing up, uh, I was curious to know what color is, because even if you can't see color, you can't ignore that color exists, because there's many things in daily life that reminds me that there's color, like things like yellow pages, Bluetooth, Greenpeace, Red Cross, Orange, Red Bull, Blue Tag, Yellow Submarine, Pink Panther, James Brown, it's in his surname, uh, Greenland, a huge country that also contains the name of a color. So every day I could hear the name of color. Uh, and I was curious to know what color it was. Then when uh, you have hot and cold water, this is also using color codes, also maps. This is a, a map, but if I, I can follow the lines here, but if I go to Tokyo, I can get easily lost because some maps only use color codes. And then also there's this situation where three countries share exactly the same flag. So also the situation when people talk about color is like um, this. If someone asked me, have you seen a man with ginger hair, blue eyes and dressed in pink? I would have absolutely no idea because the only information I get here is that the man has hair, that he has eyes and that he's not naked. So the reason why I wanted to sense color was not because I wanted to see the beauty of color. It's because it's a social element that you keep using. So I wanted to keep seeing in black and white, but I wanted to have a new sense of color. And then in 2003, I, when I was studying music, I realized that there's been many theories around the world relating color and sound. So I was interested in this relationship. Newton, Isaac Newton created this scale that relates each color of the rainbow to a musical note. And after him, there's been many, many more theories relating color and sound. And actually, color and sound are very strongly related because color is a light frequency and sound is a audio frequency. So they're both frequencies. So in 2003, we created a, a project with the aim to extend my senses by hearing the sound of color. So if we could hear the light frequency of red, we would hear a specific note. And if we could hear the light frequency of blue, we would hear another specific note. So we created a software. Uh, so I, in 2003, it was a webcam connected to a five kilo computer and a pair of headphones. And the software was transposing the light into sound. And then I was able to hear the sounds of color. So I got used to hearing the colors. First, it was six colors, then 12 colors, then 24 colors. And after some time, I kept upgrading my sense of color until I got to 360 different notes, one for each degree of the color wheel. So this is how I hear color. So it's sine waves, electronic sine waves. It's changing, it's going up from orange to yellow now. So it's extremely microtonal. So at the beginning, I had strong headaches because there's color everywhere. So I kept hearing electronic sounds wherever I would look. And this was confusing. But after some time, the brain got used to it. And then all this noise of color became normal. And my brain started to have favorite colors. It goes up and up. So violet is the highest pitch. It's very high pitch. And red is the lowest. So when I was able to sense all the visual colors through, through this, I didn't see why I should stop there because there's many more colors around us that we cannot see like infrareds and ultraviolet. So in 2008, I extended my perception of color to infrareds and ultraviolet. So now sensing infrared allows me to know if there's a 
the alarms are on or off in a shop or in a bank, because if I hear this infrared, it means that there's movement detectors. If there's no infrared, it means the alarms are off. And in many cases, the alarms are off. So it's good, it's interesting to sense this. Also, uh, ultraviolet allows me to know if it's a good day or a bad day to sunbathe. So if I hear that there's a lot of ultraviolet, then I need to put extra cream or I just don't sunbathe because it can damage my skin. The aim is to continuously extend beyond ultraviolet and beyond infrared. Now, this is the sense that I developed by joining the software with my brain, but then I didn't want to use technology and I didn't want to wear technology. I wanted to become technology, and that's why I started designing a new body part. Uh, first, I thought of having a third eye implanted in my head, but then I realized that this would just limit my vision to what's in front. So then I looked at nature and I saw that many animals have antennas. So I wanted to design an antenna that would be implanted in my head and then I would be able to hear color through vibrations in my skull and then I would hear the different colors depending on the vibration. So the aim was to design this antenna and when it was finished, uh, I tried to find a doctor that would be willing to drill my head and implant the antenna. I went to the doctor and I said I wanted an antenna implant and the doctor said, no, we don't do this here. You, if you want to have an antenna implant, you have to talk to a bioethical committee and convince them. So I, I talked to the bioethical committee and they said no, because this is not ethical, because it goes beyond human sight. This is in, it includes infrareds and ultraviolets because it's not ethical to have an antenna because humans don't have antennas, they said and also because they were worried about the image the hospital would have if someone came out of their hospital with an antenna. So they said no, and then my challenge was to find a doctor willing to drill my head anonymously and implant the chip and implant the antenna. In the end, I found one, and then we did the surgery, which took around three hours. So basically, we reduced the hair, then we, uh, we, we removed the hair, then we reduced the skin, and the head was drilled four times, two for the antenna uh, structure, one for the chip, and a fourth one uh, that we included is internet connection so that I can receive colors from other parts of the world or from satellites. So if I want to sense the colors from space, I can connect my head to NASA's International Space Station and then I can sense the colors from space. So now it's an antenna that allows me to perceive my uh, surroundings beyond my body and I'm using the internet not as a tool, but the internet as a sense. The antenna and my head took two months to merge, so the bone and the chip merged for two months and now it's completely fixed. So if someone pulls the antenna, it's like pulling an arm because it's completely inside my, my bone. This is an MRI scan of my brain now I have a new sense, the software and my brain have united and have created a new sense called sonochromatic sense. So when I sleep, my brain creates electronic sounds depending on the colors that I imagine in my dreams. So if I dream of a clear sky, I hear C sharp. If I dream of oranges, my brain creates F sharp. So the brain is creating the same sounds that the software does. And that's when I felt cyborg, the union between cybernetics and organism. Cyborg is a feeling of uh, not feeling the difference between technology and yourself. So at that moment, I was feeling a union, a strong union between cybernetics and my organism. And that's what I tried to explain to the UK government in 2004, because they didn't allow me to renew my passport, because there's a law that says Electronic equipment is not allowed on passport photos. So they said, no, you have to remove this and send us a picture without the antenna. I said, no, this is a body part. This is an extension of my senses. This is my image. I am a cyborg. I feel that I'm a union between cybernetics and organism. And they said, no, you have to remove the electronics. And then this became a battle with the UK government in 2004 and after some months, they said, yes, okay, and then they allowed me to appear with the first, uh, this is the first prototype of the iBorg, and then I, I renewed the picture with the new antenna afterwards. This allows me to travel around the world without having too many complications at airports. 
my life has changed in many different ways because before I would dress in a way that it would look good, but now I dress in a way that it sounds good. So I decide which notes I want to wear. So if I want to wear C major, I wear pink, blue, and yellow because this sounds C major. So this is a happy combination. If I'm sad, if I have to go to a funeral, I wear a minor chord. So I would wear these combinations of colors in a funeral. And if I want to wear a song, then I can design different clothes that sounds like a melody. Or like I designed this tie that sounds like electronic music. So the melody starts up and then I can scan the tie and I can listen to electronic music. So the longer the melody, the longer the tie. Also, the way I sense food has changed because now when I look at food, I can compose music and I can eat my favorite song, uh, depending on how you use the color on the plate. And we've designed a plate player or a chromophone, which in a restaurant in Spain, now you can go there and you can eat a song. And we presented this last week in Madrid and it will soon be available so that people can compose music with food and eat different melodies. Imagine if uh, you know, like maybe there's a teenager that doesn't like to eat vegetables, but if the vegetables sound like Lady Gaga, maybe they will eat the vegetables. So it's a different way of sensing food. This is how I hear different objects and vegetables. So. I can now compose music by looking at things. I don't need to play an instrument anymore. I can just amplify the sounds from my head to the audience and look at different objects and then I can compose music with color. So my experience of walking around a supermarket has changed a lot because it's like going to a nightclub. Supermarkets uh, have lots of different colors, so lots of different notes, especially the zone with cleaning products. That's the most exciting area of a supermarket. It's like electro pop music, and it's extremely, extremely loud. Milk is silent, so uh, white things don't sound. If they're completely colorless, then there's no hue. It's not only supermarkets, it's also art. I can now listen to a Salvador Dali, I can listen to a Picasso, I can listen to an Andy Warhol, because painters have become composers. Also, I have painted my house, so it sounds good. My living room sounds C major. The floor of my house is red, because red is the lowest sound. The ceiling is all black and white, because it's silent. The kitchen is violet, because it's very loud, and it keeps you alert. And the exit door is green, because it's like a tuning fork. It's in the middle of the spectrum. Also the way I sense people. Uh, if I look at someone, I can listen to someone's face. So I can listen to the sound of the eyes, the lips, the skin, and the hair. And uh, I can, instead of drawing someone's face, I write down the notes and then I send an MP3 of their face so that they can listen to themselves. And the first face I listened was Prince Charles. And I asked him if I could listen to his face. And this was his reaction when I asked him if I could listen to his face. After him, I've been listening to many faces. Everyone sounds different. Judy Dench has silent hair, like a glass of milk. Uh, James Cameron has a very loud skin, very uh, shades of uh, E, very loud and high pitch. Al Gore has different notes in his eyes because it's different shades of turquoise, so it's different notes. Uh, Moby has one note less because he has no hair. Philip Glass sounds very microtonal because there's very, a lot of different microtones, almost like his music. And Bono has very, very, very loud glasses, uh, very high-pitched glasses. What really surprised me through all these years that I've been listening to faces is that people that say they're black, they're not black. They're very, very dark orange. And people who say they're white, they're not white. They're very, very light orange. So the fact that people say that humans are black and white is completely false. We are all orange. Another project was around Europe. I tried to define each city with different colors. Cities are not gray. Each city has a dominant color. So one of the projects was to detect the dominant colors of cities. Madrid is amber terracotta. Uh, Lisbon is light yellow and turquoise. London is red and yellow and so on. Each city has its own dominant colors and they're never ever gray. So hearing color also allows me to paint what I hear. So 
it's not only that color is sound, sound is also color, so I can paint music. This is Mozart's Queen of the Night, note by note, so I start the first note in the middle and then the last one in the end of the painting, so that's all the music into color. And this is Baby Baby by Justin Bieber, so it looks very different. It's, it, it turns out very pink, surprisingly. And then you can also transpose speeches. When we talk, we use different colors, and this corresponds to different, different dominant colors when we speak. And then you can also create color concerts. So instead of giving musicians a score, they can actually learn the color codes, and then they can play colors in the day of the concert. And this is also a public sculpture that allows you to hear a melody if you walk underneath. With a mobile phone app that we created, you can use your mobile phone to hear the sound of color, and at night, you can also hear the sound of the colors projected in the street in, in Barcelona. Cool. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, well, Neil and I are friends since we were children. So, since, since we were children, we always talk about perceptions and color and how to perceive the world in a different way. So wh when he started to experiment with the with antenna, I re there was a there was a point that he was uh, the better in perceiving colors. He like he had a deeper experience uh, of color. So I got jealous, and I also wanted to to perceive the world in a in a different way, in a deeper way. So my first experiment was uh, I made these kaleidoscope glasses that would allow me just to see shape, I just to see colors so like, without any shape. So, so Neil and I would comment each other the, the colors, the exact colors of the things all around. But, but it was extremely uncomfortable and very confusing because I couldn't like see people or cities where I would travel. So I would be just in color. So as I'm a, as I'm a choreographer and I'm a dancer and I dedicate myself to movement, I thought that I would, I would, I would have to extend a sense related to my world, which was movement. So. The, my first experiment was to sense a speed. We as humans, we don't know the speed of the people walking around us. So I thought it would be really interesting to develop this and have a sense of the speed. And the first thing I did, it was this glove that I would point on people and then I would know wha in what speed the, pe the people would walk into. So after wearing that for a while, uh, I realized that this was just information. I would know the speed of the people, but I didn't want to know the speed, I wanted to feel the speed. I wanted to, this to become a sense. So to be more integrated to my body and not have just information, I, I transposed this glove into an earrings. So I would wear an earrings that would vibrate every time someone would pass in front of me. So if someone was walk, walking from right to left, I would feel a vibration in my right ear and then in my left ear, and depending on the interval of each vibration, I would know the speed of the people walking around me. Um, so I would wear that for a while, and then I realized that uh, depending on our context and who we walk with, uh, our, our walking speed changes. So if you go to London, you would probably walk a bit faster than if you go to Rome because uh, there's this common sense of movement and there's this adaptation of walking speed depending on where you are. So I travel along with Neil around Europe, we hitchhike for a while, and Neil would uh, look for the dominant color of the cities and I would look for the dominant speed of the, of the citizens walking. So I created the movement dictionary that would define each capital of Europe through their movements. So now I can say to dancers that they can move in like London, or they can move like Madrid movement, or like, like Prague. So, and I realized that the fastest movement in Europe would be London, and then Stockholm is also really fast, and the slowest city is the, the Vatican City. In the, there, no one, no one never runs there. And after detecting the, the speed of the people, uh, then I realized well, then I decided to turn my earrings around, and this would allow me to perceive the, the presence behind me. Because the, the back of our bodies, I think we, they're very dead in sensory, 
sensory talking, we, all our senses are very focused in the front of our body. So this would wake up my, the back of my body and also the, the space awareness. So now I could feel the presence if someone was close to me or not. And this could be also be uh, used in the daily life. Like you could say someone comes behind and also in the dance performances, the, if dancers would feel what they have behind, probably the choreographies would look very different. And after sensing, experimenting with the space and with the speed, uh, I wanted to perceive something more universal. Uh, I want to perceive movement in a deeper way, but uh, I want to perceive movement that didn't come from people. So I imagine like if I would be alone in the planet, how would I still perceive movement? And then I realized that the, actually the planet constantly moves. It not only rotates, but it also shakes every day through earthquakes. So I thought it would be amazing to transform a massive movement as an earthquake to transform it to one body. So I decided to perceive uh, earthquakes. So I created the seismic sense, and now I, it's part implanted. I, I feel earthquakes through my arm. Every, every time there's an earthquake anywhere in the planet, in real time, I feel a vibration. So now I'm connected. I feel more connected to, to the planet. I, before, I knew that the planet is alive and it moves, but now I feel that it moves. So I feel more connected to this living thing. My perception of the planet has changed. And now I also feel like if I heart, like if I have two heartbeats, I have my own, and then I feel the earth heartbeat all the time in my arm. And I apply this also to my artwork. I have this piece that it's called Waiting for Earthquakes, where I stand in a cube waiting for an earthquake to take place, which is very often. And then I move according to, according to the intensity of the movement. So it's a, it's a piece based on real time. And it's like a, a duet, like the, the earth decides when. And then I transform this movement, this natural movement to one body. Um, and last month, I did my first step to also perceive moonquakes, because now uh, the cybernetics and becoming a cyborg, cyborg also allows to feel and to sense things that are very far away from, from you, like I feel earthquakes that are happening in Japan or in Alaska or very in the other side of the planet. But cybernetics also can allow you to perceive things that are outside this planet. So my next step is to feel moonquakes. The moonquakes are happening in the moon. So I would feel, I feel earthquakes in one arm and my next step is to feel moonquakes in the other arm. And this is just the first step that I did a month ago. Um, and also we apply this to some uh, scul uh, sculptures. This, uh, this is a 3D version of my arm um, that uh, it's exhibited in Barcelona, in Spain, or Catalonia. Uh, and it vibrates every time there's an earthquake in real time. So it works like, like my real arm. So people can touch it, and whenever there's an earthquake, they, there's a vibration. So we call it cyber sculptures because it's, connect, it's a sculpture connected to a living organism. And we also created, uh, Neil also did uh, Neil's head. It's a 3D version of Neil. So now he's actually connected to the, the exhibition in Barcelona, and, pe and the visitants can send him colors to in real head. time in, yeah. in Neil's head. And then he will create an art piece from that. And Neil and I, in 2010, created the Cyborg Foundation, basically with three aims to help humans to become cyborgs, to defend the cyborg rights, and to promote cyborg art and cyborgism as a movement. And we also, now, uh, this year, we're going to launch, launch the Cyborg Nest, which is a, a business that will, that will do more the, the, practical, the practical stuff that we, that we created in the Cyborg Foundation. We, will, we would work in in more products that people can buy and try on and implant in order to extend senses. Yeah, cyborg. so the word cyborg comes from the union between cybernetics and organism. So there's many definitions of the word cyborg because depending on how you define cybernetics, 
depending on how you define organism and depending on how you define union, you can have many definitions of the word cyborg. So there's, I think, three basic different types of cyborgs. One would be biological cyborgs, people that have cybernetics in their biology, so a union that is physical. Then there's psychological cyborgs, which is lots and lots of people already are psychological cyborg, which is a, a psychological union between cybernetics and their organism. And you can notice this in language, like maybe 15 years ago, people would say, my mobile phone is running out of battery. Now many people say, I'm running out of battery, as if the mobile phone was them. So this uh, talking about technology in first person is a clear sign of union, psychological union between cybernetics and humans. And the third type of cyborgs is people whose brain have been modified due to cybernetics. So we'll find three different types, but it's now we see that psychological cyborgs are the transition to biological cyborgs. We'll start seeing more and more people biologically uniting to cybernetics, and in the 2020s, it will be normal to meet people with new senses and new body parts, and seeing no difference between body and technology. We are slowly becoming technology. One of the senses we are developing is the internal compass, which is a small implant that can be implanted anywhere in the, in the body, but basically if you have it here and you walk around, you feel a vibration whenever you face north. So you'll be able to sense direction and you'll be able to sense orientation with an implant that vibrates whenever you face north. It's a sense that many animals have. Pigeons have this uh, sense. Also, there's a theory that dogs also have it. So there's many other animals that can actually sense the north. Sharks in the, in the ocean can also sense the north. Yeah, this is the very, very first prototype that we did of the perception, of the space perception. And it will be probably uh, some uh, a piercings on each ear that will vibrate every time you, this presence behind you. Yeah, this was so the first prototype four years ago, but now it can actually be as small as, as, uh, as it could be implanted in the bone. So it's infrared that vibrates whenever there's presence around you. So if you have uh, four different entries in your bone, that vibrate, it gives you a 360 degree perception of, of your surroundings. Also, we've yes. created uh, uh, electronic eyes for blind people that might want to sense other shapes or distance or even words so that you can hear a book. Instead of translating a book into Braille, you could actually hear the book or also detect distances, light, and not only color, but also shapes. Also something that is not uh, cybernetic, but it's uh, very practical. If you have a tooth missing, we're also designing uh, teeth that have light, so that in case of emergency, you can just click, and then you open your mouth, and you have emergency light. So this is something that is very simple and very practical if you have a tooth missing. Uh, I'm also designing another tooth that it will go in the other side, because the problem with this uh, internal light is that we're trying to find a way that it doesn't go on and off when you eat, because when you eat, it goes on and off, so we're trying to find a system that doesn't go so mechanically. The other tooth will be a, a tooth that will allow me to move the antenna without using my arm, so it will be a, like a mouse that will allow me, through my tongue, I will be able to control the antenna through Bluetooth. So it will be a Bluetooth tooth that will allow me to control my antenna. So uh, as I was saying before, we are both now using the internet as a sensory extension so that we can sense what is in space. In the 21st century, we no longer need to physically go to space to explore space. We can actually stay here and we can send our senses to space and feel that we are there. And in a few decades, we'll even be able to 3D print ourselves in other planets. Now that there'll be DNA printers, we'll be able to print ourselves on the moon or on Mars, and then we'll be able to use the internet as a sensory extension that makes us feel that we are there. So we might be able to explore space while lying in bed in our bedroom, and we'll be able to feel that we are out there. When I connect to NASA's International Space Station, my, my perception of color is not here, it's in space. And when moon will connect to moonquakes, to the moon seismograph in the moon, her, part of her senses will also be in space. So 
we should start exploring the use of the internet as a sensory extension that allows us to explore space and to start using the internet as a sense. Yeah, and we, I th we also think that we can learn so much from nature and from other animals. Sometimes what we think it, it's very unnatural is actually very natural. It's like if we, if we take other, other senses that animals perceive and we put these senses to our bodies, our perception of the planet can be very different. We can, thanks to cybernetics, we can rediscover the planet where we live in and, and, and perceive it in a deeper way. We believe that becoming a cyborg is not about becoming like a machine. Mm -hmm. We think that becoming a cyborg is becoming like an animal, like other species that can sense more than us. In my case, I feel closer to insects now because I have an antenna with other insects, so I share a body part with them. I feel closer to my cat because if I see that my cat is staring at a wall, but I sense that there's infrared on that wall, I know that my cat is actually looking at infrared, not at the wall. So it gives us a, a, a new type of communication that I didn't have before. Also sensing ultraviolet allows me to understand insects or bees when they go to specific flowers. If I hear that there's a lot of ultraviolet in a flower and I see that there's lots of bees, I know why they're going there. And also hearing through bone conduction makes me feel closer to dolphins because dolphins also hear sounds through their bones. Also moon feels closer to other animal species that can sense earthquakes in a greater level than us, and she feels closer to nature. So we strongly believe that the use of cybernetics as a part of us can actually reconnect us to nature and to other animal species in ways that we've never been able to connect. Thank you, we, we Thank are happy you. now to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, this was a pause. Ah, this is the show. See, um, I don't know how the quest Q and A. Uh, how does this work? Here. Ah, okay. Hi, here. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm uh, really impressed. I never thought this can be possible yet. And I have a question about the energy. Uh, how you plug your cell phone, <laughs> how this works? The energy is one of the biggest issues for cyborgs because we want to use our body energy to charge our new senses and our new body parts. Now I use a magnet stick every two months. I have to remove magnets, but the aim is to use a, a turbine in my blood vessel. So it, it will be charged by blood in, in my in in the neck so basically like the rivers rivers can be can create energy I'll be using my blood vessel as a charger so blood in my case but you can also use other types of energy like kinetic or breath or brain waves but yes that's that's one of the one of the biggest and main aims for cyborgs is to charge ourselves with our own energy. We don't want to depend on external energy. Hi. How, how about maintenance? So if something fails, you basically have to you operate yourself. Yes. Okay. So once you open your body, it's easy to open again. So people think that if you have an implant, it's forever, but no, you can open and close like a book. It, we shouldn't be so scared of opening and closing our skin. It's, it's, not so, it's not that a big a deal, but this is inside my bone, so it cannot be removed. The chip is inside the bone, but I have Wi-Fi connections, so I can, I can modify or extend my senses through the internet. So I can upgrade my senses through the internet. And Moon's case, you can just, Moon has here, you can open and close this. Uh, we could do it now, but <laughs> if, if, uh, as long as the space is clean and hygienic, it's just uh, 20 minutes to open, change the chip and put a new one. And it's much more practical than wearing it because it's waterproof because there's no, and it's much more practical if it's inside. Question. Uh. 
posar-nos aqui, por ser, não? Hi, my name is Rafael. I go speak in Portuguese. Okay. Oh. Oh. How are you? <laughs> no, we're coming back. There's a translator here. Sí. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so, I'm going to Yeah. Oh, Fezus. Primeiramente, eu gostaria de parabenizar a coragem em vocês Thank you. não somente aprimorarem os sentimentos, as sensações, mas também abrir um leque para aquelas pessoas que não têm as sensações de senti-las. É, eu vi ali a apresentação dos deficientes visuais, é, eles estão se sentindo mais inclusos devido a essas experiências que vocês abriram. E eu gostaria de saber, eu tenho um projeto pessoal, que eu tenho um primo que tem uma doença degenerativa e ele é, não tem movimento no corpo mas o cérebro funciona. Quais são as, as tecnologias menos invasivas, talvez, tipo eletrocefalogramas, que podem ser utilizadas para criar uma interface de comunicação, porque hoje ele não tem comunicação nenhuma. Obrigado. Yeah, I think um, we are all, everyone, Everyone here needs to extend their senses. If we all compare ourselves with any other animal species, we should all feel disabled. So, in a way, we are all uh, disabled if we compare ourselves with other animal species. We've met hundreds and hundreds of blind people that do not want to extend their sight. We've met uh, groups, associations of deaf people that don't want to hear. And we've met people that see perfectly well, but they want to extend their senses. So there's a situation where there's people that want to extend their senses and people that don't. And it, this has nothing to do with which senses you are born with. And this is something that it, it, it's, uh, it's actually, we receive more emails from people that want to extend their senses than people who, from the outside, it, it looks like they need senses. But it's not like this. It's uh, It, it's a very personal choice that people that are curious to perceive a bit more. And I, if, if, I don't know if your, if your cousin would like to sense, uh, or yeah, it would be interesting to know more about the specific details of your, of your cousin, but uh, maybe we can talk afterwards. Okay. Thank you. Over there, here. See? Ah, there? Hi, uh, I want to know how does your antenna work because uh, I want to know about the range that you you have to face it, your antenna close to the collar or... Yeah, so I decided closer. it would pick up the dominant color, so it gives me the dominant color around me. So if the dominant color is that wall, then I hear that. But you could, if you want, you could have an eye tracker that detects your eyes, but I didn't want color to be connected to my sight. I wanted color to be independent from my eyes, but you can choose how you want to, the antenna to work. It could also be stereo vision, so it could give you the dominant color of the left, or it could be four, or it could be the eye tracker. So I, I sense the dominant color. Right now, what are you hearing? Now I'm hearing the C sharp here, and F sharp, So different shades of orange here, and then different shades of uh, like blue. This is F. She sounds very F. So different notes when I move. Like dominant okay. colors, dominant notes. Yes? Ah. I will ask in, in Portuguese. Uh, eu, você, sobre os projetos, Yes. Sobre os projetos que vocês citaram, eu, eu vi que vocês falaram, uh, utilizam uh, os sentidos como audição ou tato. Uh, você tem em mente algum projeto que possa traduzir essas sensações exteriores uh, utilizando o nosso sentido visual ou olfativo? So, 
That's right. Mel, no? Okay. No, it's not. No, that we are interested in not using existing sensors. We are interested in adding new sensors. So in my case, this is a new sense because it's a vibration in my head. If I was deaf, I could still feel color through this uh, vibration in my head. So this works without eyes, without ears, without smell. It's a, a sense that works independently from my other senses. Moon's earthquake sense is also independent because it's a vibration in her inside her elbow. So she doesn't have this sense. It's a vibration in a vibration. So it's a new sensory organ. So uh, we try not to use existing sensors. That's why we don't use electronic glasses. We don't use headphones. And we won't use any anything that has to do with uh, modifi <coughs> modifying our uh, existing senses. Sorry. But, but there's lots of people interested in extending their perception of a smell. But actually, a smell is a very difficult, it's a very unknown sense. So we have to think of a way of, of transforming. Uh, well, we actually want to, to perceive yes. dangerous smells in yes. another so way. We are developing we the sense of dangerous smell. So that if you are sleeping and there's gas, you will be able to feel that there's a toxic uh, smell around you. So toxic smells, we should have a, a new input to detect toxic smells that our nose cannot feel or, or smell. Yes. yes, this is one of the, we're uh, working yeah. on this one, yes. I don't know who has a microphone, yeah. So for people that want to become cyborgs, how do you start, how much does it cost, where you, would you advise these people to go? I think yeah. places like this in Campus Party, where there's people developing technology, this is where, where you should start. This is where, instead of creating sensors for machines or for robots or for cars, we should start developing sensors for our own body, not sensors for mobile phones, not sensors for wearable technology, sensors for our bodies. So it's collaborating with people from here, uh, uh, students from biocompatible material, people that are creating biocompatible materials that can be implanted inside, and then also with doctors, because doctors should help us do all the surgery. So it's finding the team that actually can help us extend our senses. And now, yeah. uh, that's the, the aim of the Cyborg Foundation, is to try to join all these people together. And finally, there should be a cyborg clinic, in the same way that there's a dental clinic where you can have teeth, or a plastic surgery clinic where you can have, face it, you should have, there should be a, a cyborg clinic where software developers, uh, biocompatible material uh, people, and also doctors collaborate and help people that want to extend their perception of reality. Uh, and also we think not just, not just about the body, also about the mind. I think we, we find more interesting how to extend your mind, how you would perceive, not, not so much about how your body or what, so physical, it's more about how would your mind change? Yeah, so simple things like the earrings that vibrate. This is the sensor that we use when we dry our hands, the sensors that turn on and off. So this sensor inside the machine, which maybe costs $10, you can remove this sensor and have a piercing in your, in your ear that vibrates. This will give you a sense of what's behind you. So it's for $50, you can actually extend your senses. So you don't need to have a huge amount of money to actually start exploring sensory extensions. We can do it with very simple technology that already exists. Hi. Hello, Here. Mitch. Hi. Uh, I have a question. What about uh, pitch recognizing? Uh, you, you said that you can distinguish between colors with different pitches, but uh, as a musician, I know that it's not easy to recognize absolute pitches. No. And did you get used to this? How much time did it take? It took me take? three years. So three years of constantly, constantly hearing one octave. After three years, it became normal. So it's uh, just, I hear color, visual color in just one octave. And then there's 360 notes in this octave. So it's extremely microtonal. And I started with just 12 colors and then 24. And then slowly, my brain started learning. But before that, I could not recognize 
G from A. It, uh, I couldn't hear the difference, but then it's practicing for three years. And uh, I'm still hearing color now, so it's um, practice. Another sim simple question. Is it possible to turn it off? Do, don't, you, don't you bother about all this sound always? No, I've, I've been hearing color for 12 years, uh, and I've, I'm used to it. It's completely normal. I, I cannot switch it off. There's no switch, but I can turn off the internet because uh, through all this time, it's only happened once that I've been physically hacked. So someone uh, sent me colors in my head, and he was not uh, one of the people with permission. So I've been physically hacked, and in, in the case that they would do this at night, I could switch off the connection. But uh, it only happened once, and I actually liked being hacked. It was a nice experience, so I actually liked it. Thank you. Yes, Tano. Okay. Who is it? Yes, Tano. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Joshua here. Uh, sorry about my English oh, no. first. Uh, I'd like to know if, if you want to become a cyborg, do you need a uh, permission or an allow from a government or for, uh, from some other organization from science? I don't know. Um, first of all, you need to be over 18, we think, because otherwise your parents would be very, we could, uh, we could be in trouble with parents. So first of all, 18, and then uh, we do a psychological test. We have a cyborg t psychological test just to make sure that the person is ready to do this. And then there's a period of trial where you try the sense from the outside. So it's an exo sense. So for a while you wear permanently the sense, and then when your body gets used to it, your brain gets used to it, then you do the implant. So there's two stages. First is the brain and the software need to merge from the outside, exosenses, and then when the brain and the software feel comfortable, then you try the implant, the body and the technology. And there's two chances of re rejection. One can be brain rejection, so maybe your brain does not accept the new sense, so then you don't do body implant. But if you have uh, no uh, brain rejection, then you can go for body implant, and then there can be body rejection. So there's two. Uh, situations and if you go through both then th the project went well so then you can have it and then we would follow as well how the person develops this sense yeah well, I've got two questions uh, first first one is you said I guess I'm too close to the speaker first first of all you said something about the, the colors that you were in uh, the colors that you're wearing right now, what does they mean? And the second question, how are you able to go out in the sunlight and the sunlight doesn't actually bother you a lot? So what I'm wearing now today, you say? Yes. So this is G and C. So this is GC. It sounds like a chord, major chord. It's nice. And uh, when I hear sounds, this is different from hearing. So this is an inner sound and this is an outer sound. So normal sound has direction, whereas this color does not have direction, it's inside. So it's like thinking of sound. It's a different, it doesn't, it doesn't clash, yeah. And what about the, the sunlight? How do you react to it? The sun? Yes, the sun. No, how, pe how people react. How, sorry? I mean, because of, of its power of the sunlight, doesn't this bother you a lot? Well, sometimes if there's a lot of ultraviolet, because sometimes the sun creates a lot of ultraviolet sound, then it, it can be uh, annoying, because ultraviolet is very high pitch, so it can be very uh, dominating. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> No, sí, sí. Hello, 
Yes. Uh, I would like to know what is the best way to fight against discrimination, uh, to fight uh, against uh, discrimination against cyborgs? Uh, well, cyborgs are now a minority group, so like all minority <laughs> groups, we have problems. Uh, me Especially going out in the street, yeah. Moon's are, Moon is invisible, so she has problems at the airport because she pips when she goes through control, and then they scan her and they, they see she has something strange in her arms, so they don't like her at airports, but... But Neil, it's worse. But in my case, it's very visual. So <laughs> I have a lot of people laughing at me every day since 2004, or people trying to pull the antenna as well, especially the people that try to pull the antenna. It's the same type of people. It's uh, drunk women. So I try to avoid uh, late nights in pubs because uh, if women get drunk, one of them will try to pull the antenna. It's always happening. So this is a situation I try to avoid. Yeah. But slowly, I think there'll be more people with new body parts and more people with new senses and it will become normal to to be a cyborg but at the moment it's it's a bit socially it's a bit um, it's, it's a bit uh, there's a lot of talks every i have to talk a lot with people and strangers every day yeah. see thanks for the presentation uh, have you ever seen the TED talk with David Eagleman about sensory substitution and sensory addition? Uh, he does this in no invasive ways, but he showed us an, ex an example of a man who senses the stock market. And he was doing buy and sell um, decisions and he was receiving feedback on his back. and. For now, it's pretty promising. It's like two or three percent better than a normal fit. What do you have to think about this kind of interaction with uh, artificial senses, with artificial things to sense? Yeah, we're not interested in, in this direction because uh, this is not a sense. This is information through touch. So it's not really, uh, it's not extending your senses. It's actually sub substitution of an existing data into a, a something that you can feel but it's not a it's not an yeah, existing you, you can already see the feedback no with your eyes it's it's not it's it's nothing different i don't know how to explain it we don't uh, see it as a sensory extension we see it as a a way of receiving information it's information transformed into information we see it but uh because there's two ways of using cybernetics. One can be like this, uh, could be giving me the, the name of the colors, for example. It could be saying blue, yellow, and that would still be cybernetics, but that's not the direction we would be going to because that's not, my brain is not actually creating a sense. So, but we like to in, have inputs of existing reality, not mankind reality. Like, the stock exchange is this thing created by humans. It's not an existing thing in nature. And we're interested in nature, not in humans. <laughs> so like telepathy or things like that, we, we wouldn't be so interested in that. We, we're interested in um, natural elements. Things that already exist but are not approachable for us right now. <laughs> in Portuguese. Português. Ok. É... <risos> Mo, como você se sente emocionalmente é, se, ao sentir tremor, por sentir tremores, por sentir é, coisas externas? Como você se sente, por, por exemplo, sentir um, um terremoto, não sei, é, pode contar alguma experiência pra gente? Yeah, I feel, yeah, this sense not only connects me to the planet, it also connects me to other people. So, yeah, th this sense not only connects me to the planet, also to other people. So if there's, when there was this very big earthquake in Nepal, I was actually sleeping in New York, and for the rest of the day it felt really weird because I felt like I was there, but at the same time I was very far away. 
And what makes me like really, really believe is that earthquakes are a natural phenomenon. They shouldn't be bad. It's part of our living planet. The bad thing is that humans haven't been able to adapt to it. So my aim is like to find a way to, to, to adapt to this natural phenomena. So I feel very bad and, and sad when this natural thing destroys people's towns and, and kills people. I feel very weird, but it also wants me to push to make it. I hope, I hope one day earthquakes are not seen as a bad thing anymore. You said your antenna was part of it came apart. You, <laughs> you said your test on, test on. Uh. Uh, you said your antenna became a part of your body, right? But isn't there really any problem with this? I mean, what if it breaks? Is, is there any way to fix it? Yes, if I break my nose or if I break my arm, there's always ways of, of fixing it. The antenna could be not from the outside. Could, someone could cut it, for example, or I, I don't know, but it, there, isn't, there isn't more problems than any other existing body part. So, and the chip, if the chip ever stopped working or there was a problem, it can be open and then it can be fixed. So, as I said before, you can open and close your body. It's not, it doesn't need to be. When you close, it's not forever. Yeah, it's you can evolve your senses. Yeah, the, the nice awesome. thing about having a cybernetic body part is that it will continuously evolve. So the older you get, the better your senses will be and the better your body part. So instead of looking at becoming old as a negative thing, actually becoming old is a good thing because your senses can be better and you can sense more. OK, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Think I'm all like that.